broadcasting from the far side of Enceladus, beaming in at the speed of light across the vast chasms of space, streaming directly into your brain. You're listening to the Spartacast League. I am Phelan, and joining us today are Attica and Reconcile, so get ready and strap in. Because tonight, we have a heck of a show. A lot has happened since the last time we were on air. State of the Union speech, ICE ramping up raids across the country, and the alt-right just going nuts. But starting with State of the Union here, that was perhaps one of the most produced, staged speeches I've ever seen a president give. Was it more staged than mission accomplished? You know what? I, I would say yes. Uh, in, in, in many really? ways it was, because it was a production, but it wasn't like a big production. And I think that the difference here... He landed on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> Okay, okay, maybe you have a point here. But one of the things that I did notice here about the State of the Union that that makes everything so important, because a lot of people, even if they disagreed with Trump on political issues, felt good about the speech because he is, at the core, an entertainer, and he knows how to deliver feeling to people. And so a lot of these people were kind of taking in that fill that he was producing because he was able to create a package which people could digest. People forget Trump is a businessman and a negotiator, albeit a terrible one, but he's also a reality TV star. I remember his first State of the Union address. That night, he just had Democrats and everyone just fawning all like, oh, there's presidential Trump. Oh, now he's so great. I remember the things he talked about were like ICE and arresting illegals and committing atrocities and being a fucking criminal. The same thing goes with Oprah, too. It's like, just because you can be a showman. They're able to give a good speech and make something sound presentable that is abhorrent. And why, especially now after a year, I mean, there was less of it. There was far, far less of it than there was the first day of the Union. But still, still people fell for it. Still, I saw the applause. I mean, I know that the entire Democratic Party, no one, no one got applauded. But like, Well, in fact, he actually said that the Democrats were treasonous for not applauding him, by the way. It only served to justify their decision not to stand up. For once, they look like rebels. Earn that stupid rebel alliance symbol that you appropriated and don't even understand. But yeah, no, you're right, because the content of it was just, it, it was insubstantial and or abhorrent. Because pretty much it was just him talking about ramping up ICE and then using a Latino as a prop who was an ICE agent or talking about how great the economy is and everything, which then subsequently, the week later, <laughs> just <laughs> fell into the toilet, right? I mean, come on. He walked right into it. Couldn't it have happened two or three days earlier? How great would it have been him giving his State of the Union speech in an old box in the corner under under the scrolling header on CNN? Be just talk tanking. <laughs> couldn't life couldn't couldn't it have been in store for 2018? Isn't enough weird random crap happening where that could have been in the celestial cards? Oh my god, yeah, and how much how much did that stock market drop? The stock market itself actually traveled as much up and down this week as it is in volume. It, it traveled like 22,000 points or something like that, which is extremely volatile. It did dip because it was at 27,000 at its peak. That was like January 26th. Now it's sitting just above 24,000. So it's dropped a couple thousand cents. On the surface, it was almost, you gotta wonder if the fact that he was applauding the economy actually made it go down. Because, I mean, as we know, like, so much of his speech was just flat out lies and fabrication. So much of it was, like, the immigration stuff, because he sat there and he went on about all this, like, comprehensive plans, uh, you know, to allow three million immigrants in who are of good moral character and all that. Meanwhile, ICE is going in the hyperdrive 
deporting people that served in the military, for instance, or people with no criminal records that have been here otherwise living peacefully and the only so-called crime that they've committed is just being in the United States. Or 7-Eleven, for that matter. Uh, I remember pretty recently there was a r series of raids, like dozens apparently of 7-Elevens across the country and New Jersey. My home state was one of those locations of the raids, which is just so transparent. Why are they going into 7 Eleven? Is it really hard to see? How did Ice get across the bridge? Did they have to move Chris Christie again to do that? <laughs> yeah, they just dumped him in. God, I win. So I, I understand you guys got rid of him, right? So, like, what do you guys do with him now? Well, probably some some kind of mafia shit's gonna happen to him, I'm sure. God, I wish he could have been vice president. He was going to be vice president. <laughs> what? Fuck whoever told Trump to pick Pence. Because it would have been so easy to get rid of. Oh, he what? more corrupt than Spiro Agnew. He would have been the easiest freaking card to deal. You could have gotten rid of him, and then there'd be no nothing scary beneath Trump, and you would deal with Ryan, and we and that would just be your, your weird little libertarian snake fly animal. I God, mean, you say I wish that? Chris Christie could have been vice president, because it would have been <laughs> so fucking... You say that, but look at what he did in our state. <laughs> like, he got away with and it. Look at how there were no he consequences. No, he, didn't, he didn't get away with it, though. He forced to reopen the bridge and the GOP is so corrupt that okay if they impeach Trump and then impeach Christie like by the time they were done impeaching people we would have President Tex Drillerson or whatever the f its name Tex is <laughs> Tex I'm drilling right now yeehaw and I'm from Texas Tex Drillerson one of the things that got rid of Nixon so easily well, it was because Spiro Agnew was gotten rid of so easily could you have imagined President Spiro Agnew? Good God, don't know. That's horrible. No, no, we got we got President Fumbles Gerald Ford out of that, and we survived for the time being. Ford was and not exactly a great him. president, though. I mean, he's generally no, considered to said, be one of the most incompetent presidents in history. I just said Fumbles Ford. He just. You would have had the same dynamic with Chris Christie, I think, and it, it would have been so much easier. It would have been watching, like, the odd couple on television, except <laughs> with the presidency. It really, it really would. Like, uh, I'd be able to take this whole thing with a whole bigger sense of humor than I already take it, if that were the case. The entire State of the Union, I mean, it was just like one blowhard boast and lie after another. But then him chaining those up there, using people as props this point he brings somebody out to use as a prop tells their story and i don't recall any state of the union address where this was done in in living memory at least certainly at least certainly not on this level and i think that that also kind of goes towards that trump showmanship that i had mentioned earlier showmanship i guess and it also really shows his character he's the kind of person who's not gonna shy away from using people <laughs> i mean that is like an obvious reading of it and i think it's pretty sincere you know he's really not going to care if he has to use people to do his bidding or for a purpose you know they're not people to him they're tools to be Dude. fair though i mean is that is that really it though or is it that he knows how to make a production and create things in a package that people can digest and what he's doing here is he's creating a narrative using tangible examples and saying look at this you can have all the data in the world, but people will react to anecdotes far more than they will hard data and numbers a lot of times. And so when you say, look at this, it makes people pay attention to it, especially if you can give an emotional story behind it. And that's what he did. What's sad is that we on the left have so many better anecdotes. I mean, how hard do you think they have to have to find what limited quantity of a number they have of blonde white women who have been slighted in any such way by an illegal immigrant versus the, the, the unlimited supply of I'm poor, got kicked out of my house because I lost my job and now I'm homeless and dying of cancer stories that we on the left have. 
it should be a no brainer, but we we have not yet developed a propaganda distribution machine. Also, people are, are taught to believe that that's somehow that person's fault too. That they kind of deserved it in this kind of like gross way too. So there's that end of it. So you got to get people to start caring by making it hit home. Yeah, the just world, uh, the just world fallacy, which is a common cognitive bias. I feel like we over the past year, that's probably been on the information perception front where we've made the most progress. I feel like on the left, we've chipped away at that a great deal just because of the, the massive amount of people who have, who were never expecting to feel that kind of, the, the experience that kind of issue, uh, having experienced it, I think is, and us being able to explain why it's happening, you know, with our, our usual 200 year old books uh has done a great deal to chip away at that whole you know you're poor because you deserve it you just work hard deal but maybe i I just am more tuned in to the left than than most people i went out i think that some one of the things that stood out to me though as far as claims go was the whole like thing with like the chain immigration and everything like one person can bring another and bring another and stuff like that and it really ignores the fact of how difficult it is to actually legally immigrate to the United States because I know immigrants that are here legally. A good friend and former co-worker of mine, for instance, back when I was uh, working at St. Vincent de Paul's, was like thrilled, celebrated. He's like, it, it's like my five-year anniversary or something like that of uh, being an American. And I looked at him because I was like... You've been here like 30 years though, right? And he's like, yeah, it took me almost like 20 years to, to get fully legal citizenship. So he'd been basically living here for that long before he was even given like full citizenship. Yeah, that's one of the things that makes me so furious. It just in, in tandem with the style of this State of the Union and in general how, how policy is talked about. It's just so two-faced and you would want to believe that we live in a world where the the spread of information through the internet and through you know just people talking is enough to combat this gross untruth but it it seems like it's just so simple that it's so easy to lie to people that you can straight up have a policy you can have a certain platform that your government is based on and then all you have to do to make people believe otherwise and not actually respond to that is just to straight up say we have a different policy like i mean the president obviously is not ignorant to the way that immigration works in this country he's in the rooms that are talking about immigration policy it's not that he doesn't know it's just that he's straight up lying he's obviously lying it makes me so mad that we don't as a nation it's so easy to dupe people right like when he talked about like islamic terror and then he basically just gives the alt-right a carte blanche on terrorism doesn't even mention them but most terror attacks in the united states are right-wing terror attacks we've got to acknowledge though that there's a huge this country is very rapidly producing a, a generational divide. There's no, almost no overlap and consistency in in, in in the receiving of information between millennials and baby boomers. But it's, baby boomers will still follow and read the old channels of television and newspapers and uh, you know online newspapers. But I mean, it's still the same controlled information. Whereas fuck all for that for us most of us don't even have cable most of us don't even have tv you you know what is uh, interesting though about that is uh most of the silent generation that's still around because i speak to a lot of people that are 80 90 almost uh, kicking up 100 because of my job and basically like you get these like older you know gentlemen on the on the phone at work and you know they'll you know they'll talk about the the topics or whatever and they're like embarrassed what their children are up to like the baby boomers and the maga chuds and stuff like that 
Yeah, and I mean because the the Make America Great Again fuckwits aren't actually knowledgeable in any way about politics and the gravity of those politics. It's all, you know, this selfish game. Most of these people that are sitting there screaming Make America Great Again are like my age and weren't even alive when America was supposedly great. Most, Most of, of them, them, yes. So I also was going to say that the silent generation was probably the only real educated generation in this country. They were they, they were they were educated before there was much of an ideological indoctrination that took per- supremacy over actual education. And they were also educated in the most left-wing president and government that we've ever had. The average age for joining the army was what 17, 18, if not before there, so you pretty much went from high school to Europe fighting Nazis. Yeah, they they grew up pretty much their their entire lives under Roosevelt. There's definitely that ideological difference. I wonder though, what's going to be the effect of the nature of information transfer? Because you know they were indoctrinated by left wing people or whatever. Uh, or they were educated without the right wing indoctrination, and then the uh, the next generation, the baby boomers, they were indoctrinated. But again, you had this top down information flow in both cases i wonder how things are going to be different when we're not talking about what what group of people had the power over education and policy and politics but instead we're talking about people who all get their information through the internet how is that going to change things how is it going to change the generational awareness about policy about global events etc I've kind of been kind of skeptical that it's a good thing, actually, because what we've really seen with the internet is, for as great as it's been, I do have to issue some skepticism and some warning that it's also kind of led to this situation that we have right now with the alt-right. The internet really kind of created this undercurrent that's swollen up. No, the last depression lack of opportunity and general wage enslavement of millennials created it the military i mean the, the military uh well yeah that too but uh the internet merely facilitated the the discussion of this it uh, created a means for the spread of right-wing propaganda in ways that were not available and i think that they also kind of caught on earlier how effective it was and they spent years crafting this too like this isn't something that they did overnight of course like the whole alt furry thing that took 10 years for them to develop and come to a head with and really you could take all of this wow that what an accomplishment (laughs) exactly and what an accomplishment it was i mean attica are you changing your name to nazi fox because we're giving up now What, what Are are we going to start an alt furry podcast instead? I'm kidding. What? Uh, No, I don't get the joke that you're trying to make. Because obviously they've taken over the fandom. Oh, right. Yes. They have one outright. uh, We are only, you know, allowed to. They couldn't even fucking decide what they even wanted the fandom to be. Oh, oh, they they were just, oh, we don't want it to be all SJW. Okay, what? You want it to be something that it's never been? God, all furry is such bad Nazis. Like, they didn't even make an iconic reference and false history of a supposed golden age of furry that they were supposed to harken back to, which is a requirement for Nazism. They didn't even say, well, we've deviated from this path and we need to go back to the true way of being furry. They didn't even lay out that vision. They just fucking fumbled over each other. It was stupid. It's not like mythology has a shortage of furry well i wouldn't say furry influence but like stuff that furries could look at and say yeah that's interesting hey i mean there's at least one all furry who did it dionysus right (laughs) yeah but that's lame i mean that was i didn't say he did a good job i just said getting back to to the uh, state of the union trump really boasted that military too that 80 billion dollars that was far more than trump uh, asked for and i think it was like double or something like that that was gonna happen regardless of who was president 
So, I mean, it's not like, like he's the deal maker there. Because that was a bipartisan effort. So good on that, right? I mean, okay. So just like every single claim that he made was just boast after boast of either things that would have happened, things that either aren't that great or whatever. But as far as the, like the military did, the one thing that really kind of shocked me and the fact that people actually like clapped and shouted for it was this whole thing about the U.S. like liberating uh isil territory when it wasn't the u.s that liberated isil yeah it was the sdf and rahava if anything the u.s probably protected them uh when they were evacuating raqqa because the u.s went in there with the same white toyotas that they went in with loaded up ISIL fighters in the middle of the night and drove them into the freaking desert. Yeah, but what did they do with them then? Who knows? That's the disturbing part. Is now, now we have this like shortage of terrorists because the U.S. went in and cut some sort of deal. <laughs> we have a, we have a shortage of terrorists. These same people that were causing all these problems, right? Where are they? Why are they not being brought to justice if they were so bad, right? And no one's asking that question. No Republican has asked or even brought up, where's ISIS? Why is it not being asked or investigated? Where did they go? And why was this done? Because it's not like it was an obscure thing. It made headlines on The Guardian. It made headlines in Newsweek. It made headlines on The Intercept. Not minor publications. They'll be back in five or ten years with a new name when we need another. Well, of course, they, 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 they always come. return. They always the return. Con- the communists were so good at killing the terrorists. We had to go rescue the terrorists, so there'd be terrorists for when we need them again in five years. Yeah, well, that's how it's always been in the Middle East, anyway. Al Qaeda sprung from the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, which we funded to fight against the Soviet Union to create their own little like quagmire there like we got caught up in Vietnam. It basically helped break the Soviet Union military-wise and economy-wise because they had to pour so much money into that war. Gotta love them coops. Yeah, and look where we are now. No one in Afghanistan. Everybody shut up. I think Gackle's in here. I I crashed the party. I feel awful. Hello. (laughs) Hey! Oh my god! I thought I, th- I I thought you were sick. I thought you were dead. Well, I am sick and have an infection, but I'm here. S- sorry. I'm laughing that that he he said sorry for no reason. I know that I, is that's absolutely I, sorry. I, I just showed up unannounced though. Like, <laughs> oh no, it was awesome actually. I appreciate it. I I love it. No, that that so, was that was the most Canadian thing ever though. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm here. Sorry. So let's talk about how many U.S. military bases are currently in Rojava, because there's about one every 10 miles right now. That has me worried because, like, right now, Rojava is getting buddy-buddy with the United States. I don't think that's a good idea long-term for Rojava or the Kurds. I'm sure they had a choice. For them, you know, they had no good options. They had to choose between Putin or they had to choose between us. Both would have fucked over their left-wing ideas. I think they probably chose what they thought was probably weaker of the two countries. Because, face it, like, we're going to be... These wars are going to kill us. No one invades Afghanistan. Alexander the Great didn't invade Afghanistan. No one, historically, is stupid enough to invade Afghanistan and keeps their empire. And we fucked it when we went into that desert. And we've been there since 1991. But Trump bragged about that $80 billion we're getting. I, God knows we need it because the Pentagon just lost $800 million that they can't account for. I don't know how you do that, but they did it. I doubt that it can't be accounted for <laughs> it's, it's, I know, right? Like it, It's not that it's, it's not accounted for. Of, <laughs> it's in the pockets of the ISIS soldiers that we carted out of. <laughs> it's, it it's, the desert. it's it's how they bought all those white Toyotas that they went in with. <laughs> this is uh, uh, semi related. Recently on YouTube, I saw an ad for like pro Turkey anti YPG, and it basically the, the whole ad was like going off. Oh, look at these YPG people! They're terrorists. They're awful. And it was just 
fucking what? surreal. I got. I got to go find don't it. Don't you use adblock? Well, I do, but it was it was on my phone, so like. Oh. But Why still, is it's, Turkey it's bothering? You, from you who? Asked, Where was this ad coming from? I'll have to go find it. Like I'll link it, but like Russia. Yeah, it, it was fucking bizarre. So there's already a propaganda campaign. Oh yeah. Well yeah. I think it's wasted money because ask twenty Americans, only one of them will probably have even heard of Rojava and know what it is. And okay, maybe two of them, two of them will know, will have heard of Rojava and know what it is. And only one of them will actually know the political ideology of the of Rojava. The others are just gonna know. Oh yeah, those are those people who fight ISIS that America helps because America's the good guy. So I don't know why it was wasting that money if they're trying to convince Americans. I guess by extension Canadians. Yeah, I mean, unless there's going to be a turn of the sights to them. The fact that we've helped them might just mean... And I mean, this is really just guesswork, but who knows? Like, why would we help Rojava if not to influence them? And to do so, to influence that geographic region, the geopolitical region, you'd imagine that there needs to be some unsettling of the dominant leftist, you know, create, there. Create, create a fuck-up zone that permanently occupies Turkey in serious time. Who knows if we actually care what their political ideology is. We know that it's going to make a fuck-up zone for Turkey and Syria. Which, by the way, how much longer can Turkey re remain a NATO ally, right? I think with Erdogan, it's not going to last too long. But yeah, one of the things I, I wanted to go back with, though, on that, that mentioning about that that 800 million, though, that just kind of disappeared from the uh, Pentagon there. Did you guys know that one time the Pentagon lost like three trillion dollars or something like that? And what makes this really ominous? Do you know when that was? Does anybody remember that story? What oh why it was significant? Was it like September 10th, 2001 or something like that? Oh my god, how did you know? Wait, are you kidding? Uh, I guessed. It was September 10th, and it was the last anybody had really ever heard of that story. I believe it was like John As Ashcroft came out, or Donald Rumsfeld, I can't remember, came out and announced that the, the Pentagon had this like huge loss on September 10th that they couldn't find like three trillion dollars or like some absurd amount. And it's just like, how do you lose that? And then the next day, 9-11. So convenient timing, I guess. I don't know. I don't like 911 conspiracy stories. I don't I don't so, really like it either but like so it is often the their right wing conspiracy stories in the vein of infowars bullshit. It, it is it is the most like terrifying thing like if you like put it together and it's like okay so another 800 million I I know scale is like way different here obviously billion or millions versus billions or trillions. That have that's not a like a small sum of money and it had to go somewhere so it's not lost that, 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 that's enough that's enough to give isis back their, their trucks yeah it's pro it probably probably sure. has something to do with them driving isis into the desert and yeah it's it's it it can't be pretty though i'm just saying i did want to go back on on not isis but ice here in the united states which I guess is just as much as a threat to us here. Well, not me per se, but a lot of people in the United States. They've just been ramping up detainments. Here's the thing about ICE, and I'm actually really amazed when it talks about it, because wealth stratification is so severe in this country that if you make $500 more than someone else, you're likely never going to interact with that person with $500 more than. Uh, you know, a month because you'll be renting in a completely different part of town. You're never going to see ICE roll up in their cars and carry away a small child. I'm surprised it even makes the news because it's such a thing that could just so easily get swallowed by the barrio that just becomes, you know, something that only people who live there experience. You know, ICE isn't going to go into any other kind of neighborhood. I've, I live in Arizona, and I haven't seen ICE perform any of those kind of raids. And I live in a really poor area where it's mostly working class black and Hispanic people. And I just, I got to think, wow, that must mean I am not at the poverty level to experience ICE. 
Perhaps. But the other thing is, is they're targeting it in a very interesting manner because what they're wanting to do is they're wanting to make sure that they get whoever they're targeting. One dirty trick that they've been doing up in Oregon is they actually are in plain clothes. They just walk up on Hispanic pe looking people walking out of courts is what they're doing here. They'll ask them basically for their papers that, you know, see some ID. I want to, I, I want to know, are you from here? You know, that kind of thing. They'll swarm them and it's all plain clothes. So it looks like just a bunch of people just badgering, you know, the person. And there's video of this too. It will not surprise me if somebody one day misinterprets this as something, goes to their car and gets a gun and pulls it out on one of these guys. Because quite frankly, if that was me, that I would be tempted to do that because, you know, you follow me to my I, car and start asking me questions aggressively. That's that's asking for a fight. Your white privilege is showing. Yeah, I don't think that many people who are in that in that position are going to be pulling guns. <laughs> OK, you maybe. Know, maybe you, yeah, surprised. you got a point there. I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if you or me decides to be you know the one with the gun you know i've asked myself this moral question and i'll probably get in trouble for saying this but i've asked myself the moral question if i see that happening what am i going to do and i've decided it damn well isn't going to be nothing and it damn well isn't going to be some half little attempt you know that some like liberal would do or they try to go and reason with the police or something everyone as they grow up and they learn about nazis and they watch nazi movies and nazi documentaries and they say if i was there i'd shoot the gestapo if they tried to take my jewish neighbor and that's happening and yeah, it literally it's is time for all of those people who grew up seeing what you know had that moment and said that to decide whether they're gonna fucking do it or not half of yeah. the half of the <laughs> tough guys that said that are freaking wearing red hats right now talking about how manly they are so i mean there's that too like, yeah we gotta it work was just, out it was just cool. posturing no no i'm talking about the maga chuds that's what they became because they were doing that for posturing they weren't doing it as some like serious political statement well, I don't know. I mean, if that was true, then you wouldn't have something like Antifa well, that's suddenly, true. I guess it's true, yeah. spontaneously happen in the United States, which has zero history of this kind of mass mobilization. I, I wouldn't mean, say zero history. We had it. We just lost it a long time ago. In, in, in the 30s, you didn't really have necessarily mass mobilization of like Antifa type things. In the 30s, you had a government very antithetical to national socialism. You know what is and interesting? You had, an, you had an FBI that devoted massive resources to crushing national socialist movements in the United States. And of course, you had an FBI that also went after community defense leagues as well, because up until about the 1940s and 50s, there were actual community defense leagues in place and like tenants unions things like that so like if the landlord sent the police over to you know your home they'd figure out oh the police are coming and there'd be five dudes with guns you know at your door ready waiting for the police and the police wouldn't you know touch it of course because they weren't as armed as they are now what's amazing about the fact that you bring up the history is the, the recent discovery, uh, at least from The Guardian, in this story that you shared earlier with us uh, about how the police in, where was it, California somewhere. California, working, yeah. California yeah, Highway Patrol working with the traditionalist workers party, which were basically neo-Nazis, to frame Antifa, basically, and to spy on them. And it ended up with a black activist getting stabbed. Can I ask? Uh, what part of California? Because there's, there's very it, much it looked like Sacramento, uh, which doesn't surprise me, because that's kind of northern California. Yeah. Well, so east of sort of the line of L.A. and San Diego, because they're pretty much directly north of each other, it is a red state. And it is definitely very much the fault of California that denies them resources and says, grow all our food, you dumb hillbillies. 
Yeah, and it um, ignores their needs over the needs of the city people, and so there becomes this cultural and economic divide in the country. And of course, people living out in the country blame it on those city liberals. So yeah, this that this is where this is happening. No one lose your head because the San Francisco police, which I'm, I'm sure, if this was the LAPD, I wouldn't be surprised either. But fuck, everyone... <laughs> The LAPD is under so many magnifying glasses. It is just, yeah, just like to clarify what part of California this isn't. This is in red state California that is not politically represented whatsoever within the state because it has abysmal population density. But the whole th- situation with ISIS is, is like they want to make it out to sound like like even during the State of the Union, Trump was like bragging about like half of the MS-13 has been deported or is in jail. And it turns did you out. Say, did you say ICE is or ISIS? ISIS? No, I said ISIS. So basically Trump made this claim, for instance, during the State of the Union that half of like MS-13 is like in jail or been deported. And the numbers are pretty pretty well researched on it. That there's probably about ten thousand MS-13 members in the United States or so, and that about two thousand have been deported or or in jail right now. So his claim is is by far underwhelming. If if that's the case, it wasn't just ICE that did that. That was like the FBI and a bunch of other institutions and local law enforcement mostly that has been dealing with that issue not ice ice instead is targeting people like a, i saw a story where a kansas chemistry professor was rounded up in front of his children while getting ready to take them to school on his lawn and so that's that's what they're targeting for the most part what happened to him because i mean i can imagine him not being a citizen if he's a chemistry professor, he obviously is on some kind of teaching exchange. He's obviously supposed to be here. That was right. He's he's apparently wanted here, right? I mean, because he he wouldn't be here as long as he had. I mean, even if assuming he right. overstayed his visa, I mean, he's providing a useful service to him and his community. This isn't somebody that like Trump he's would say is a criminal, a right? Day. So what happened to him? Uh, so, uh, they they rounded him up and they're trying to deport him, and just like everybody else at ISIS, r- rounding up. Basically, they're putting him in these little, for lack of a better word, concentration camps. And if you see the inside of them, that's exactly what they are: is concentration camps. They're not pretty places. Uh, I saw a photo where they had people just sleeping piled up on the floor. Yeah, I've I've, I've seen those photos. I've also seen all of the Twitter liberals going, oh my god, what what is this? Without realizing that we've basically had immigration detention centers for like 20 years that are basically that. Now, the thing that d- did like really kick me though, that I, I got a little bit of a giggle at though, was this uh, the high school student that got expelled for uh, reporting another student to ICE because he started bragging about it on a, on his freaking Reddit. This is alleged, <laughs> of course. That alleged, yes. It's it's not 100% that that's what he got expelled for. There's perhaps maybe some debate as to what has happened here. But it I seems mean, like man, he was expelled for the post is what it looks like. I would love to be in high school right now because, man, can you imagine? It must just be like a climate of just students organizing <laughs> to fuck over <laughs> the right wing fascists in 4chan in their class, right? Like, can you just imagine? You know, that's what, you know, during lunch. High school kids right now, they're not talking about Justin Bieber or whatever the fuck. I'm not in high school. But, like, you know, they're talking about... So, so, so you know Johnny, three seats over in English, is a fascist, right? Yeah. Let's go... Just just go break the windows on his parents' car after school. It's funny because, you know, you have Teen Vogue being one of these magazines that is, at, at least in the past year or so, was like publishing these really just spectacularly leftist articles. Like they were coming out, and I mean, they wouldn't be like super, super radical, 
but it was more so that they were being shown around just like any other article and they were just very woke like these teen vogue articles <laughs> to the point that people were starting to call it teen rogue i think the word you're looking for is progressive i guess so yeah, yeah. when you're a liberal but you don't want to be called a liberal because it's got a bad connotation of being feckless and inefficient. I mean, progressive, honestly, is a better label. Like, it's kind of what I go It by, is, like, and that's unfair. Progressives are actually progressive. They do actually want single pair. They don't quite challenge capitalism itself, but they don't think I should just work and die at 30. You, you know Pro what, though, about this whole situation, though, with this kid, though? You guys, like, saw the picture of the guy, right? Unfortunately. Yes, he's in the hat. Yeah, know. exactly. He's in the hat, and he has like, the freaking, like, a pipe a coming out something yeah exactly on and his you, shirt and it's probably like the okay sign right right and you know what, what puzzles me about this whole thing is why do all the like young maga chuds they like, all look like they're wearing the freaking purge mask are they getting ready for the new movie that's coming out is that what it is i think it's more likely they're just having murder fantasies to be you honest know, it's really weird it, because it's not like 4chan post self-care guides it's not like there's the 4chan approved haircut list no know? that's the nazi it's haircut weird. it's weird how like they all look exactly the same when like that's not even anything that's discussed on 4chan so i, guess I mean they there's take a... their cues from pictures of well-dressed quaff nazis yeah, there's definitely, almost, like, the pressure in that culture, subculture. It's almost as if it's a cult. <laughs> almost. You know, there's- I'm sure that there's a difference between the two. They really did go into high gear, though. Um, it was, it was something else, so... I believe we started, like, right after we, we'd gotten off air just a few days later. Some guy from Michigan, like, calls up CNN and, like, threatens them and says i'm gonna shoot you guys up and it turns out like the guy was just totally nuts he was uh like he worshipped hitler kind of nuts i mean isn't that how it always is i mean yes i wasn't surprised when i saw the story and then like started digging through the details because i was like oh okay trump guy whoa okay yeah he's really out there like but these people have been around i feel like it's wrong to call like trumpism a new phenomenon because it's it's really it's been around since the 90s it's been around since you had since you were able to sell moral majority in the 1980s since you've been well it's specifically become a thing since it's become a market even with the moral majority stuff of the 80s you can't really sell those people a t-shirt ever since you were able to sell them 10 pound buckets of tasteless dehydrated mashed potatoes in preparation for the enemy of the day so you're you're saying it's because of the commercialization of it kind of like they creating like a, a lifestyle here if you will there is there's money to be made you can sell trump hats and t-shirts and stickers in fact i'm i'm curious if anyone's done any reports or investigations into who self sold more stickers the trump people or the liberals what 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 sells more resistance t-shirts or trump hats i think the, bernie sanders probably sold more stuff than hillary clinton right okay but i'm talking specifically like post-election resistance democrat stuff i'm still hoping for bernie 2020 man now you know it man ah, i'm hoping for corbin whenever corbin just like as president of the united states we just bring him over <laughs> oh well like so so bernie and corbin special relationship grandpa edition <laughs> oh i love it like that's what the propaganda would be too it'd be like them walking along the isle of man you know like discussing the great future of democracy that was almost the future so close basically my point is these people have been around ever since they've been a market ever since you could sell them hats and t-shirts and you just change the hats and t-shirts are you know every once in a while you just change what the enemy is you know now it's illegal mexicans was you know before it was just liberals and before it was y2k and then it was mexicans again and, you know it's uh they're not they're not gonna ever really go away until you abolish markets listen liberals you want to get rid of the white supremacists abolish markets 
but they won't. Reactionary tendencies are probably going to be something very difficult to beat out if we ever can in humanity. I don't like to say it's bred into us, but it's so it's ingrained in into it's our society that it certainly feels like it. It's, it's hard to get out of that mode, especially if you've been in it all your life. It doesn't take them that much to push them over the line. I noticed that too. Like, like, like you, t it, it doesn't seem to take a lot to take somebody who is libertarian, all free markets and everything else and push them into that direction. And then all of a sudden, bam, you got Mr. Freedom over here has become Captain Nazi. How did this happen? So what you're saying is horseshoe theory is real. But only within relevant, only within the same ideological spectrum. Dude, no, it's not horseshoe theory. It's fishhook theory. Well, fish no. Hook I, so, but... so horseshoe horseshoe theory contends that you know communism and fascism are so close together, the same thing. But I, that's bullshit. But horseshoe theory is real when it relates to fascists and libertarians. I wonder I wonder if that means that like anarchists are all tankies on the inside. I am a self-identified anarcho tanky, hello? <laughs> exactly. Oh Honestly, God. I kinda wanna like put that in my Twitter profile just to fuck with people. <laughs> anarcho tanky. I don't think that I don't I don't know if I'd call it a horseshoe, but I would definitely say that there are different um they have different perspectives to offer and they have different values and principles that they prioritize so i really think that i'm in the i'm of the opinion that it we should we should be calling them like tendencies in the left or you know these perspectives to consider as opposed to you know hard line ideologies that define us and i mean that's just me because i don't think that aside from specific programs put forth by those parties by those groups i don't know that either the tanky way or the anarchist way is like a complete answer when it comes to the complex system of power and hierarchy that we are hierarchy that we deal with so what you're saying is you take the gunner's seat and i'll take the driver's seat <laughs> in my tank and we'll get there in the morning look i'm <laughs> i'm just saying that as people who are oppressed, we need to consider all our options and we need to really pay attention to all those principles. We can't blind ourselves to certain options because of our affiliation. You know, if anything, we should be weeding out options because, you know, they're actually bad, but not just because they're, you know, not the, the assigned policy of, of the anarchist platform or whatever you take the gunner seat i'll take the driver's seat we'll all get there in the morning <laughs> but getting getting back to this though uh more seriously the the violence on the alt-right is is very serious right now we had a, a riot at uh it was colorado state university where actually neo-nazis this time were the ones that got violent with the crowd and just kind of went at it with the assistance of yeah yeah and they, they did it with the assistance of police too so i mean like police stood down and let them let them do it eventually yeah antifa kind of you know fought them off and everything i mean it just goes to show that these guys are coming in more and more prepared and we got to come in ready for that there's no winning for us because even if we did manage to defeat the skirmishers, the MAGA chud, red hat wearing the fascist channers, we're tired out when we have to face the militarized police. And it's almost... Yeah, no, I... And, and we also face the problem of, okay, fine. I get you. Antifa militarizes or whatever. And we start actually learning tactics and whatever. And we start going to these things plan. Well, then, I mean, we just end up being a self-fulfilling prophecy and the right gets to say, oh, they're terrorists and, and they, they, you know, they come plan to these things and they just want to start trouble. And it's, 
I'm just, I'm not sure what to do about that, because then the other side of that is you don't do anything just to maintain the good press and more high ground. It's like, I don't know, we have to decide how far we want to take it. Yeah, and then there's obviously the, and you know, doing it intelligently and really organizing in a way that doesn't get us targeted, get gaining power, gaining energy, and establishing a foothold of whatever kind of currency matters, um, whether it's money or social currency, whether it's popularity in the eyes of the public, like we do need to intelligently gather as much of those resources as possible without becoming targets, you know, without being either thrown under the bus of right-wing rhetoric or uh, just, you know, failing because we don't have the energy, because we are fighting all these different battles, you know, against whether the military's police, police or the cult, more culturally oriented groups, you know, of, or activists, grassroots activists. And then on top of that, not only do we have to worry about the brawlers, there are outright people looking to to murder people on, on the left right now. It, you know, serious discussion here, Adam Waffen division, and people like that. And I've seen comments on Twitter from you know right wing people. Uh, one just recently, and I, I really wish I, I had it so I could throw it up on on the screen and everything. And if if I did, but it was basically some guy. Uh, bragging that uh, he wanted to, to kill people. No, it was the University of ne uh, Nebraska guy happened just the other day. Adam Waffen Division, though, very similar to this, but they've actually killed people. At least, no, it was, uh, it was five murders, not three. I was going to say three, but it's five murders in, in one month. I want to ask a question that hasn't, uh, so far I've not heard anyone ask yet, and I think it describes more than anything the state of the global left and answers... The, the, the leftist Chinese question more than anything is that the alt-right and the neo-Nazis get financial propaganda and even emotional support from Russia. And yet Xi Jinping is nowhere to be found. There is no aid sent from what claims to be a socialist country to the socialist foot soldiers on what is quickly becoming and boasting is its rival and soon to be great enemy. And I believe that if China does not wake up to that fact, and if Xi Jinping is tr truly wants to make his PhD in Marxism mean anything, that I believe he needs to start considering investment in the global left. I, I really don't see Xi Jinping looking at, the, at Antifa in America and saying, hey, this is a worthy investment. I don't yet, see it because... No one would have said that of Putin... And it has pulled off what most thought was impossible. No one thought, who thought throwing any kind of political financial support to 4chan would have accomplished anything in the world? Well, I'm sure that there are among, you know, their military experts or intelligent experts, um, people who specialize in cultural warfare and how to spread narratives. I mean, I know that I've come across documents, not like, the documents themselves, but um, more like ads for speaking events and descriptions of like seminars for CIA, I think, or just in general, US intelligence kinds of people, like the kind of event where you learn how narrative works and how like certain kinds of warfare are committed using that kind of like storytelling and spreading that culturally. It's a like grassroots supplement to top-down government information spreading but there, there definitely is research on how to do that and that research is utilized by governments they definitely really take those grassroots tactics and use them to supplement their own big machine of propaganda and so where is the chinese government the chinese government passed up a golden opportunity to take in and shelter edward snowden Instead, Edward Snowden had to go to Russia because China wouldn't take him. Yeah, I mean, that says something. <laughs> China's messed up so many times, though, when it, when it comes to spreading the ideology. Because, really, I kind of feel that they just didn't, they didn't have a grasp of on it because they were they were still trying to figure it out themselves kind of thing because this was a country that came out of feudalism 
to create this. They didn't have any you know past experience with democracy or anything like that. So like, they're, they're working from the ground up to build these institutions, to industrialize, to do all of this work. And there was very little to, to base it on. That's a monumentous task in Is and of itself. Is that much different of a story from Russia? Was Russia really all that yeah. more industrialized than yeah. China? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it was the same way. And, and actually, I would say China maybe had the advantage because they were 30 years distant from the you know the russian revolution or so you know yeah they they kind of had that advantage though but they also had almost a billion people i think it was like 700 million people or something like that at the time so it's a it's a big nation you're talking about a lot of people and there was only one other nation that really did this at that time period so you have to figure in the historical reality of everything too but there there are things that i think that they could have done better and but as far as like the left in america goes i don't think that we should be looking to china i don't think that that would be a good thing for us instead i actually think that we should look at how how we did things in the past a little bit with like groups in the 30s groups in the 60s you know things like the black panther party build on that work recreate that work and retool it to modern society while looking at what others did like the soviet union china you know taking what worked and using it taking what didn't work and tossing it out the biggest weapon that's used against the left is delegitimization, and the answer is sitting right in front of us, and then this country, only the right-wing side of this country's history is ever taught. The mantle of legitimacy of an American left that is immune to all accusations of being Russian bots or Chinese spies can be erected by reviving that abolitionist history exactly that you know, this idea that, for instance that the 40-hour work week was some like creation of henry ford because he was just such a benevolent person when unions fought for the 40-hour work week for three decades previous to that but we have to keep the anarchists happy reconcile <laughs> of course because if we go too far in that direction we get accused of being nationalists and nazbols and making it all about making america great again but left i mean i don't think i wouldn't say that that's really the 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 balance that we're needing to strike i would feel like it's more about just recognizing the reasons that we are delegitimized and i mean i think it's actually pretty straightforward like i don't think that you know we need to dig very deep because how does legitimacy get spread or like assigned? How does something get legitimized? And it's usually in our culture that puts so much value on money and prominence and political power. The legitimacy is going to be tied to, again, money and power. So, and not only that, those two things are easy to use to create an educational platform to spread an idea like you can afford advertisements you can put in on youtube an ad uh you know to delegitimize like antifa or um you know whatever groups are fighting for their independence like that's something you can do with money and power and therefore it's just i mean it seems pretty obvious that we're delegitimized because who are we you know we are the poor and disenfranchised and the oppressed in other ways so like of it's going to be naturally the case that we don't have legitimacy. And if we are to gain it, then it will require recognizing that dynamic and working around it and doing something different. Yeah. And you want to talk about revisionist history? You know, it's, it's been us, you know, the working class that's been revisioned out of history. Exactly. Exactly. One last thing, though, and it, it's kind of on a, a totally different topic than what we, we normally talk about, though, just kind of exit out here because it's just such a cool story. Did anybody see the story about 
the lidar technology that they used to expose the like the underbrush of the jungle over this you know, Mayan city in Guatemala. Gee, it's almost as if they were a real civilization with massive amounts of people that we brutally genocided. Yeah, and it I turns guess, out the context that, of the West. Exactly, like, and it turns out. But. Exactly, and it turns out though that if this is the case with this one city, if they do this on like four other cities, you know, get a nice sample size, and it turns out this is all consistent, this means that the Mayan Empire wasn't just a bunch of city states. That this was an actual like like networked area that had major roads and, and things going through it. Like it was Rome level of development here. But like people should have known to assume that looking at the largest structures there, because there's no way that these tiny little areas and stuff like that could have been as built up as they were and so people intricate. Should, people should have been able to deduce that these great bountiful plentiful forests that the pilgrims ran into when they crashed their boats and in, into the east coast oh weren't just the result of this god-given gaia land of the new world those were cultivated that was culture that, 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 that was horticulture that was native american farming you know what's not, interesting not actually of clearing a field and making squares a type of farming that has been lost that produced a yield large enough to feed Europe. You know what's interesting though about that though uh, is that in a lot of places though the jungle isn't that fertile and so that actually makes us well, all the more surprising that this area was as developed as it was because it wasn't even thought that this area could support that many people like they base these numbers off of not only city size but like how many people could it maximally support and they came up with a number about like six million or something and it turns out they got to double that number now because well, that's, good. that's because we're thinking in terms of western farming right the, exactly the, the the native california tribes had a very sophisticated way of feeding themselves what they would do is 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 they would move around and live in four different places in, in different seasons and when they came into a place and they camped they would feed off of it and then when they left they would burn it all down and then by the time they came around the next year it was twice as plentiful because all of the burnt ash would have given rise to a yield that was twice as much as the year before and so it grew these huge, I just flat out going to call them farms that doubled their yield every year in, in, a, in a place that you look at it now is historically drought stricken. It's amazing what they were able to do with the resources they were given and everything. Yeah. And it, we'll, we'll have to rediscover that form of farming completely all over again because we completely wiped it out because we fucking genocided those people. I would say if you haven't seen that article, definitely take a look at it. We'll put it in the uh, the show notes there. I just kind of wanted to give you guys, you know, something else to digest on. We leave for the uh, the week here, or <laughs> hopefully a little bit shorter span than what we did last time, and we apologize about that. But life happens. So I guess with the world in chaos, we'll see you guys later. Take care. Good night.